Today is November 22nd, 2011. My name is Tony Hilliard and I am here with Roger Sosette at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia, where we are both volunteers. With us today is Mr. Howard Hard Hardreth, a veteran who has agreed to share his personal experiences during his service during World War II. This interview is being recorded for the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project through the efforts of the, Viet the Atlanta Vietnam Veterans Business Association. Mr. Hardrath, could you give us your full name and address, please? Yes. I am Howard Robert Hardrath, and that last name is H-A-R-D-R-A-T-H. Okay. I live in Atlanta, Georgia, 30345. Okay, thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about your life growing up before you went into the service? Born and reared on a uh, dairy farm in north central Wisconsin, specifically in Clark County, Wisconsin. Uh, a very nice, understanding family so that I didn't have any trauma or travail during my childhood or my youth. Um, it was a nice sized dairy farm and uh, we lived well. We didn't, uh, we had, uh, in 1929, when I was uh, 11 years old, my father and mother built a new house on the farm. So we lived in a brand new house and a couple of big barns and silo and machine shed, granary and all that. We did not have a tractor. We farmed, we were horse farmers with uh, four big horses. and. Uh, the income came from the sale of milk, which was in a local cheese factory converted to cheese, which was then sold into the market. Um, the uh, milking was all done, milking of the cows itself was all done by milking machines. Um, but uh, when I got out of grade school, and I never went to high school because the local township did not plow the roads, therefore the snow was in the road probably two, three feet deep. And obviously snow, uh, school buses can't run in that, so there was no school bus. I was 12 miles from the high school in which I would have gone, to which I would have gone. And therefore I never went to high school. Were you homeschooled? I'm sorry? Were you homeschooled? No. Okay. Eight years in a uh, one-room schoolhouse, brand new schoolhouse. It was nice. I mean, it wasn't like we were dragging around in sod shanties or anything like that. This was a this was a nice life. We had a car the whole bit, and um, it was just a nice operating family farm with uh, a lot of livestock and, as I said, four workhorses. When you were growing up, it was as a a young man or as a teenager, were you aware of what was happening in the world in terms of Europe and Asia? I was more aware than almost anyone that I've talked to over the last 80 years because my father was always so on to watch the political and economic scene closely and we had a daily newspaper. There was no radio. What radio there was was in uh, radio stations that sent from so far away that we couldn't pick them up in the early days. I listened to my father and his brother who lived up the road a half a mile and they discussed things every morning because my father's brother hauled his milk to the cheese factory and passed our farmhouse and just about every morning he stopped in and my father and his brother discussed the current events and I stood around and listened to this. Uh, I remember remarks about uh, Calvin Coolidge. I particularly remember my feelings about Herbert Hoover, not good. Um, I was very cognizant of what was going on. I'm well aware that um, the price of milk, which was our income of course, we delivered the milk daily. Because the cows give milk every day, we delivered the milk daily to the cheese factory and it was made into cheese on a daily basis. So there was a daily product coming out of this. this cheese factory was just a quarter of a mile from our farm buildings and my job in the morning upon completing the completion of the milking process 
was to hook Queen to the milk buggy and put the milk cans in the back and go to the cheese factory, which was a quarter of a mile away. Um, I was aware of all of the things that had to do with the financing around the farm. Okay. My father was an understanding type soul, trusting. He led by example. So if we boys had to do something where we went to the local town to have some service done, grinding of grain and corn, whatever, he just sent the family pocketbook along in the pocket of his child and expected you to get back, having parted with only what you spent uh, logically or legitimately in town. Okay. Um, when I got out of grade school, I was uh, just about 14 years old. And that fell my job then to do the plowing. So I had three horses, three big horses hooked on to what we called a sulky plow, that is a plow on wheels. And so as a 14-year-old boy, I sat on this uh, iron seat. And it gets cold as hell in Wisconsin in the fall. But I had a sheepskin on top of this seat, and I sat in that sheepskin for week after week, driving those horses up and down the field, pulling a plow through the soil. I felt that I was a member of a well, working community, and it was working community because my neighborhood was uh, almost exclusively Germanic, and I was related to almost everybody on the road, either by blood or marriage. Um, it was great to be uh, related to everybody around you because I understood these people very uh, sharply. My mother was born and raised uh, two and a half miles away. My father was raised a mile and a half away from the farm on which I was raised. My mother came from a family of ten, my father from a family of seven. So when I went to local things, I was going to run into a slew of cousins, I tell you. Um, I was aware of what the milk was selling for, per hundred pounds and all that type of thing. I don't recall when I was a teenager what it was, but later on I became very cognizant during the Depression of what it did not bring and what it did bring, which was amazingly low. I'm aware that we sold a hundred pounds of milk by going through the cheese factory and making cheese out of it, that the payout to my father, the farmer, was about 75 cents per hundred pounds and uh, nine gallons of the hundred. We were talking about eight cents a gallon for milk delivered to the cheese factory. Other things had the comparable prices. That's the background I came out of. Things improved a great deal after 1932, and the spirits of the people picked up tremendously. Their shoulders came back and their eyes looked at you instead of looking at the ground. Um, things took a dramatic turn in 1932. The economy didn't improve. It improved, but not that dramatically. But the, um, the tone of the people and their mood uh, changed truly dramatically. Prior to 1932, there was no help, none whatsoever. You had to prove, in order to get food, you had to prove that you were total pauper, okay. no car, no nothing. And um, so I was in my formative years during this time. But after 1932, things have picked up tremendously. During the latter part of the 30s, yes, right. when the situation in Europe started uh, to deteriorate, were you aware of that? Well, really, it wasn't in the it was in the early part of the thirties that uh, yeah, uh, I was aware of, very well aware of what uh, Calvin Coolidge was up to when he was the president of the United States. Um, but I certainly was well aware of what was going on when Herbert Hoover was the president of the United States, and um, yes, I was totally aware of what was going on. Um, Did, were you, do you remember where you were on December 7th, 1941? Certainly. Absolutely. 
uh, my family was visiting over at my uncle and aunt's house, and uh, it was freezing on December 7th. We went down to the local river and watched the kids skate down there. The kids, that was like kids like our age at the time. And uh, we came back to the house and my father and his brother and the two wives were sitting in the living room. And uh, they said, fat's in the fire now. The Japs have attacked Pearl Harbor. I didn't know where the hell Pearl Harbor was. <laughs> so, yeah, but I remember the day very well, yeah. And you were how old at that time? I was born in 17, so uh, in the December of 41, I was... Uh, 24? Yeah, yeah, I mean you... 24. Did you volunteer or were you drafted into the service? Enlisted. Enlisted. Okay. You got it. Was that... I, uh, my parents were particularly uh, aware of what was going on in Germany. All of my grandparents came from Germany. They, um, my grandmother lived with us, as people did in those days prior to Social Security. She, her husband died and she had the farm, but one of the boys moved on the farm. So she came to live with my father and mother and the family. When Hitler took power, she never spoke another word of German for the rest of her life. She didn't talk much German anyway. She spoke right. broken English. But uh, usually if they were going to tell a dirty joke or something, then my father and mother and uh, my mother's mother, <laughs> they, they'd say it in German <laughs> and keep us kids in the dark. They thought. Yeah. They, um, yeah, I was totally aware of the surrounding scene. And of course, uh, but there was one more angle to this. By this time, we had a really nice radio. And uh, we're talking about the end of the 30s, and in 37 they came through with a 730-odd miles of High Line with a uh, rural electrification, Clark Electric Co-op took over, and we got electricity in 1937 on the farm. And prior to that time we operated with kerosene lanterns. You cannot imagine what a dramatic change that was. Truly a dramatic change in our lives. With this radio, we of course tuned in in the evening and if Adolf Hitler was making a speech, well, they'd carry it on American radio. My father would sit there and he'd relay what the bastard said. <laughs> and he'd say, he's really giving them hell now. And then he'd find a way, he said, well, he's just giving them the old soup. Now he's uh, telling what great people they are. So he would translate Hitler's uh, speeches for me. And um, I had firmly in mind that this guy was about as bad as they get. Yes, I was cognizant of what was going on around. Truly. Um, we didn't think about the Japanese at all. Um, and I repeat, I didn't really, I really didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. Well, how long after Pearl Harbor did you enlist? I enlisted on May 15, 1942, okay. but because I, my father owned two big dairy farms. One was 120 and the other was 160 acres, and we milked 42 milk cows. I ran one of the farms myself. I lived at home. I never married. And so I lived in a family situation, and I went to the other set of buildings. There were two complete sets of buildings on these two big farms. And so I drove up to the other farm every morning and uh, worked there during the daytime, milked the cows with another mil milking machine, and um, put the cans of milk in cold water in the evening and all that type of thing that goes with the dairy farming. Um, I had to tell the man at the enlisting office in Walsall, Wisconsin, that I wouldn't be able to come down for a month because we had to get that farm taken care of. So we rented the farm out to one of the neighbor boys who had married his girlfriend and all that kind of a thing. And um, uh, so I didn't, I enlisted on May 15th, but I came down for, uh, to go to uh, the induction center on June 15th. I told him I'll be here in a month and he was ready for me. 
So I went down to, uh, uh, by way of Milwaukee, and then a train down to Chicago and went to Fort Sheridan, Illinois, where I was sworn in and drew my uniforms and so forth. What was basic training like in the, in the early 40s? This is something that I don't think that you people have ever really heard of very much. Because of the lack, there was, we didn't think about a basic training center at all. Instead, we, I was directed out of uh, Fort Sheridan, Illinois, to uh, Camp Pickett, Virginia. And there they were reactivating the 79th Infantry Division, which had been a World War I unit. And uh, they had the reactivation ceremony, and I attended. And uh, Camp Pickett, Virginia was so green and fresh that the uh, stadium where we held it had just been painted green. And I sat in that, and the paint wasn't dry, so I got green paint all over the butt of my union, <laughs> my new uniform. We had a cadre in from the 4th Infantry Division from uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. They furnished the bones of the company, and the meat was coming in from all of these induction stations all over the United States. And um, our basic training wasn't under, there was no hollering and screaming in this outfit. Our, we were well aware that the 79th Infantry Division very shortly was going to have to furnish a cadre for the, an infantry division in Camp Housey, Texas. So they, we knew that they had to make, I didn't know anything about it, but they knew on the command end of the division that they're going to have to make some kind of non-coms in a hell of a hurry. So I was in the Army 30, 36 days, I think, and I was already a, I was already a sergeant. It was crazy, but um, I never went to the PX, and I, I quit reading the newspaper, I quit everything. I read the um, training manuals, and I, um, and I was a platoon sergeant for the rest of my active time in the military. Um, we took our basic training right in Camp Pickett, Virginia. We started it there. And that included a close order drill, what to do in case of snake bite. That was weird. Who the hell gets bit by a snake with, with canvas leggings on? I think that our basic training was great. It was very good. There was none of this screaming and hollering. That was just not part of the scene. Um, I think that our Division turned into a um, some of the best soldiers I've ever seen in my life. And later on, I had a taste of other soldiers. Mm -hmm. During um, your during your basic training, did, was there enough equipment for everyone? Yes, okay. we were the first ones to get M1 rifles. We got new M1 rifles covered with cosmoline and uh, washed and all that kind of a thing. Yeah, we had good equipment and. Um, we used the mess sergeant approach to the feeding process, so we had a mess hall, a mess sergeant, two lead cooks, and two kitchen workers that were permanent kitchen workers. One of those guys had a short leg and that type of thing. So um, I'm one of the few that I think. I thought the food was great. What I saw in the other troops that came in, a lot of them from not as uh, well off of families as, as I came from. I'm talking about food-wise. Remember, I was born and reared on a dairy farm. We raised our own pigs and all that kind of thing. But I think some of those fellows that came in there and ate in that mess hall didn't look that great to me. They put on weight and they put on muscle. And I think that the Army uh, ration was great. It was even great for me. Um, we had a great mess sergeant to start off with. Um, Cat Pickett, Virginia was brand new. I think I got to be a sergeant because I knew how to chop with an axe. I'm, that's partly a joke, but not entirely. Um, it was a brand new camp, as I said, and across the uh, company street uh, 
was a forest area and it had a hell of a lot of brush in it. So another, uh, this fellow was a half-breed Indian guy, Carly Tallman, a, one of the world's greatest human beings. And he came off a farm in Tennessee and he knew how to chop, so we went over to the uh, uh, supply and uh, got a couple of axes and cleaned out a place for the company to sit and listen to their uh, lectures and so forth. And we could do a lot of things. And uh, anyway, I didn't have anything to do with this. I walked along with the rest of the company, and all of a sudden they said, Hardrath, you are an acting uh, non-com. Then the next thing you know, I was a non-com. And that's the way it went. Well, where did you go from Camp Pickett? Toward the end of um, August. We only had uh, the rest of June, which was only a few days. And um, we had uh, July and August in Pickett. And then uh, by train, of course by train, the entire division went to uh, Camp Landing, Florida. Okay. For a boy from Wisconsin where it was freezing cold in the wintertime, Camp Landing, Florida with its oranges and stuff like that was a very nice place. Camp Landing, Florida was a nice place. We had hutments there, no windows. They had a flap over the top of a, uh, of a hinged opening. I mean, not, yeah, they had a hinged flap over the top of an opening that was screened. And we lived in these uh, single uh, board hutments. They were great. Um, and of course they were clean because there was uh, solid white sand all around the place. In Camp Landing, Florida, we started field work out into the uh, field and uh, overnight for a few times and then a week out into the field at a time. Um, what do you mean by field work? Uh, leave the barracks and just move and live in the field. You know, okay. pup tents and, okay. and uh, you know, take yourself a slit trench every night and all of that stuff that, uh, slow preparation for combat is what it boiled down to. We also had some training stuff that led into the uh, Florida marshes and uh, they were, of course, were making it as realistic as possible by shooting off all kinds of shots in that mud down there, you know. And here was a small alligator about four feet long floating around on top of there. We, we brought that son of a gun back to my barracks and put him in a wash tub and fed him, <laughs> fed him a hamburger out of the mess hall, um, and various other little junk like, like soldiers do. But that was a great place to be. Uh, Kingsley Lake was on the post. You could see the bottom in six, eight, ten feet of water. It was, um, it was infantry life, but it was nice. And uh, we trained, because of the weather, we could train all day, every day, and that's what we did. And our division advanced tremendously. And all this time, I'm a platoon sergeant. I never went to the PX. Again, the first sergeant, who was a 4th Infantry Division guy, gave me all of these uh, field manuals. And I spent my time on field manuals and just thinking about what a field, what a platoon sergeant should do with his men. Don't holler at them. Don't make them feel low. We had a platoon sergeant in C Company that on two different occasions had to, had to give one of his men a direct order to get obedience. My, my thoughts were, if you ever have to give a direct order, you're a lousy platoon sergeant. Well, what, what was your unit? I was in C Company. I had the third platoon of C Company in the um, 313th Infantry Regiment of the 79th Infantry Division. Okay. Again, there were four platoons in a rifle company in World War II. Three rifle platoons and the weapons platoon. The weapons platoon had 60 millimeter mortars and air-cooled machine guns. So you, when you were in Florida, that's the weapons training and field training tactics and things yeah, like that? Yeah, we went to the range from you know, Camp Landing. We'd go out to the firing range. It was interesting to me uh, to um, 
go out to the firing range because, of course, Florida was full of skinny pine trees. And they had graded up a mound there and they had all of the um, targets, oh, hundreds of them, on top of this mound. And then they had a dugout behind there where the, uh, the uh, guys that tended the targets were down there in the safety. There were so many million bullets passed across the top of that mound from the firing line that the bullets cut off every one of the pine trees and in a straight line uh, aiming from the uh, firing line over the top of the mound where the bullets proceeded, where they went over the top of the mound, they cut off all of the pine trees. That's how many bullets were fired on there. That interested me. I was a farm kid. The, um, our training in camp planning included uh, uh, battalion work. And on a few occasions, it even gave the new officers, they, they were as green as me, you know. They were guys that came in and started in at uh, officers' candidate school, came out of Fort Benning, 90 Day Wonders, and uh, they didn't know a damn thing more than I did. They were all nice guys. Um, but the officers, even at higher levels, they really didn't know how to handle a battalion, if you ask me. They were practicing, as I was practicing. And I think they did a tremendous job. We uh, did uh, unit work. We did, um, we did a lot of special training stuff there. The fellows that had to handle radio, went to radio school and uh, they had uh, many schools to which the assigned personnel went. So the schools were all within the division, all the, the technical training was I'm right not there. sure about that. That may have been a thing that they were operating on the post itself, okay. but it may have been, uh, the fact of the matter is I would guess that this stuff was on uh, blending. Okay. But anyway, our fellows went there for um, technical training of various kinds. But of course, none of that affected me because I was the uh, platoon sergeant on the ground and my, my job was to see that the platoon was operating properly. Um, every morning I presented to my officer, a second lieutenant, a platoon standing in formation and uh, the whole bit of having called off the roll, the whole thing had been done and uh, face the first sergeant and all present counted for it and salute the first sergeant. The only time you salute a non-com. And uh, then the officer stepped in and uh, came out of uh, BOQ. But uh, when he stepped in, the platoon was standing in line, standing at ease and ready to do whatever was to be done during the day. And that was the way the thing was operated. And um, Well, how long were you in Florida? We got there uh, right around the 1st of September and left there right at the 2nd or 3rd of March, the following spring. spring. So we spent the entire winter in Florida in Camp Landing. So where did you go from there? You... We went on Tennessee maneuvers then from the 6th of March to the 1st of July. That was as near hell as you can possibly get. First of all, it still snows every once in a while in northern Tennessee. And we were in pup tents sleeping on the ground in, uh, in a hardwood ridge. Um, some of the things that we did up there in Tennessee Maneuvers just don't, I think about them now and I don't see how human beings did that. On one occasion we waded a stream late in the afternoon, this was probably along toward the middle or end of March, cold. And the stream said it started raining, we got up at three o'clock in the morning and fell out and of course these raincoats didn't hold water. And besides we were standing outside in front of a pup tent when we put them on in the rain. On that day, they kept us in the field 
walking around. And the last thing we did, probably uh, a gray overcast and a very cold and windy day, we waded through a stream that came uh, almost up to your crotch. That freezing water had swollen the stream and we had crossed it. We waded that and then it got dark and started to freeze. And these men were in the outside. And of course we were in a tactical situation so you couldn't build a fire. But about uh, 9 or 10 o'clock at night the order came down, fires, oh, yeah, fires are permissible. So I had my platoon on the side of a field and there was a fence right next to my platoon. They were spread out near a fence. The hay field in which we were uh, bivouacked, we didn't bivouac, we slept on the ground. It was so wet that when you walked in it just squished up and the mud came out around your shoes. All soaking wet of course. But my platoon guide and I I had a second in command too. I had a platoon, I was the platoon sergeant. William L. Moore, Jr. of New Orleans was my platoon guide. And we put a shelter half out of our full field pack, of course, on the ground, and a GI blanket on top of that. And uh, then we put a uh, wool, wool blanket over us and a shelter half. And uh, we didn't take our shoes off. Who, nobody took their shoes off. And I'm laying there and uh, my guys had the biggest damn fire you have ever seen. I mean, the flames are shooting 20 feet in the air. I said, where in the hell did they get that dry wood uh, in these conditions? And I heard this squeaking sound and of course I'm a farm boy, you know, I know this sounded like nails coming out of wood. <laughs> when it got daylight, I got up walked over there and looked over that fence. And there was a Tennessee farm with a wood frame, it was a, it was a timber frame barn where the boards ran up and down. And they were nailed, of course, on the timber frame. There was not one board <laughs> left on that barn. That was my guys over there jerking those uh, boards off of that barn and burning them up. There was a very nondescript, very poor looking house. We, of course, my guys thought it was deserted. So they tore the porch off and burned that up. And in the morning when I'm standing there, here the door came open and some oh. little kids looking out of the door. <laughs> it was beyond belief. That day I saw a guy come by in a Buick automobile with an overcoat and he was carrying a clipboard and he was talking to the farmer. Obviously, he was there to take down what we had destroyed and obviously going to pick up the tab for this. Our officers, no one at any level said one word to us. Never. If we were going to take an entire battalion through a um, wire fence in Tennessee on maneuvers, we, um, we just cut the wire. You can't. You can't climb a battalion through a wire fence one guy at a time. Well, that was very damaging because, of course, the uh, livestock could get out, but what could we do about this? They never spoke to us about any of that. Um, Tennessee maneuvers was a, a thing that, was, uh, that did two things, in my estimation. It toughened the men up beyond belief. They, be, they were no longer people that ate with their mother and father. They were living on G.I. Chow, if they got that. And um, they were just getting tough and starting to get mean. Life was really rough out there. Tennessee maneuvers had a lot of stuff out there that was uh, most instructive. A river crossing on one of Tennessee's, I forgot the name of the river, but it was a major river in Tennessee and we crossed that with these boats that held about 15 people uh, paddling with rifle butts. Crossed the river, dumb luck, 
didn't lose a man. My company didn't lose a man. Um, and then we pulled a, uh, a Riverside defensive problem. That meant that we dug a standing type foxhole where we looked out over the river itself and down the bank to the river and defended against an enemy attempting to cross the river from the other side and come in at us. Um, we did a lot of things that were most instructive, but the main thing that happened was my men derived from this a lot of good training that became very useful later on. And in the process, they toughened. They forgot about apron strings and mother's jelly and jam. They became GIs. Um, again, there was, it was amazing for me as a farm boy to go among these farms and, uh, you know, just walk through somebody's farm and, um, Carly Tallman, my friend from Tennessee, uh, Tennessee in this area, we, we uh, pulled these maneuvers, was very hilly. And uh, we took the entire uh, regiment down one of these hills, and this was all terraced. He said, we've done the most damage today that we've ever done on these farms. He said, these guys created a path down through those uh, uh, terraces. And he said, that water's going to run down there and really tear up that field. Um, so when you left Tennessee, where did you go? After Tennessee? Um, we finished Tennessee maneuvers and got a furlough. I went to the farm in Wisconsin to see my parents. When I got back, the captain and an, and an MP was, uh, was in the uh, company uh, headquarters uh, when I checked in. Turn my pass, turn my uh, uh, pass back in. That is my authorization for a uh, uh, leave. Uh, yeah, and uh, the captain said, "Hardreth, you have to get ready immediately because we're moving out to the desert, and you're going to be the our, you're going to be our front man uh, out there. You go out there with a couple of officers, and there's some uh, ranking non-coms out of the company that are going to go out there." And you're going to go out there and, uh, and be our front man, leading us out to Arizona. And that's when I found out when we were on the um, uh, defensive position on the bank of the river, that following that, that was our last week, and from there on we moved into Camp Forest, Tennessee, but that was only for just a few weeks. For me it was just a week or two. Then I went on furlough, and then when I came back, it was hurry up and get ready and go up to Yuma, Arizona. They told me that one of my men was missing, and that during the time I was on furlough, they organized a search, and they found his partially, mostly decomposed body in the um, standing type foxhole that he had occupied with another soldier from southern Illinois. They were both in my platoon. Uh, the MP was there because the man from southern Illinois was coming back from a furlough, and uh, they knew that he was going to arrive in um, uh, whatever Camp Forest town was. I was only there for a week or two. And so the MP uh, took me down to the uh, train station and he told me how to give a secret signal to the various MPs that were standing around the area there, ready to grab this guy. They suspected the man with whom he dug the uh, two-man standing type foxhole. And uh, I went down to the train station and stood back in the shadows and I had the signal all rigged up. And when he stepped off the train, I gave the signal, and they stepped up there and took him by the arms and took him in. I have no idea whether he was convicted or not, but I'm morally positive that it was the fellow that was in my platoon that killed the man that was in the standing type foxhole with him. He was from northern Maine, and it fell the job 
of my platoon guide, William L. Moore, Jr., to accompany the body up to northern Maine. And this French kid from northern Maine uh, had to be taken back to his parents and buried there. That wasn't a great mm -hmm. sought-after job either, I tell you. But Bill Moore did it, and I would say that he did it with, uh, with grace. Then, um, I think that pretty well finishes it up with Tennessee maneuvers. It included uh, crossing rivers, it included freezing yourself half to death. It included uh, everything you can get. Red bugs were the big problem in Tennessee. And, uh, itching and scratching and uh, general discomfort and misery. Um, but it was great training. And then on to Arizona? Yeah. Yes, I went along with the um, forward party then, the advance party to uh, Yuma, Arizona. And uh, when I got out there, the uh, 8th Infantry Division was out there in a thing called Camp Laguna. How the hell they got Laguna, I will never know, but it was nothing but pyramidal tents. No floor, no nothing. And I got out there in July. And um, the first night sticks in my mind because they put us, the advanced party guys in a separate pyramidal tent on Camp Cuts, the folding variety that you take along on a camping trip. And the canvas, of course, got so damn hot and dry out there that it tore immediately and you slept essentially on those uh, folding part. We were young. Uh, of course we took um, we have taken the temperature in there. We, you know. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, it was 103 degrees in the uh, tent. And uh, that was an experience you cannot believe. Camp Laguna was about 20 miles north of Yuma, Arizona. And it was nothing but tents, pyramidal tents. As I, as I said, just sand. You couldn't keep a candle in there. We all had desert water bags. I don't know if you've ever seen one, but they're the kind where the water leaches through the outside wall of the water bag. And the evaporation, very rapid evaporation north of Yuma, Arizona, kept the water drinking temperature in the water bag. And they dripped off of one corner, so about four or five water bags would be hanging from the central four by four post in a parental tent. There's a cross member on there, and of course those water bags hung on there and dripped on the floor. That's where you kept the uh, candles during the daytime, was in the wet sand. So, um, so were you out there for maneuvers? For, for Yes, desert maneuvers. <laughs> I will say, this is where the, uh, our military, 79th Infantry Division, showed unbelievable common sense. I was out there about two weeks before my company and battalion arrived, and it was the usual thing, you know, uh, how many beds are available, and uh, you know, what do these tents look like, and uh, what does the kitchen look like, and all that crap. But, they, you know, it wasn't a full-time job. The officers had their own thing going. and uh, So by the time the uh, company got there, I was used to the hit. It was extreme, to put it mildly. Uh, the company got out there, and they did not take them into the field. They let them sit in the tents for a few days, and then they took them out for evening hikes. And the uniform of the day would be GI shorts, GI shoes and socks, and helmet liners. That's it. And they walked them around in the dusk of the evening, and in the evening, in that uniform, let's call it, until those fellows got used to that heat. And after that, we operated no matter what the temperature was. We just got used to it. You had to take your salt tablets. Mess sergeant stood there with the, with the salt tablets and he, he did everything but put them in your mouth. But you had to take your salt tablets out there. Um, there was no paving, no nothing. It was just sand. It was an outdoor toilet, hole in the ground with, with 
with uh, peeled uh, poles and stuff like that. They had a shower. The water came over from the river and um, that was just beyond belief. We traveled in areas where there wasn't a single footprint. Every kind of cactus you could imagine. Um, when I was a boy, I bought five cent uh, rough um, paper cowboy books. And they'd in the cover, they'd have a thing, you know, a stick stuck in the sand. Desert water hole, two miles, something like that. By God, I ran into several of those in the desert. And uh, we went to one of the water holes, and of course the, the wild creatures around there had to come to that water hole to drink. And of course the uh, rattlesnakes came to the water hole to eat the people, the uh, animals that came down there. So I got up there in the morning and these uh, our officers and men were out there with stones. They were stoning a couple of big water rattlesnakes to death. But the main thing that happened out was, there was that after the desert, these men just lost the softness of being civilians. From then on, they were big on uh, rough stuff. And if they got to town, got to drinking, they terrible to fist fight. I mean it. Um, one of the problems I pulled out there was my platoon leader and myself, Curtis L. Combs, Jr., was my officer. Great man. Um, six days in the desert, we took a fortified platoon, my platoon, and uh, from D Company we got a couple of jeeps with trailers, and uh, they had the winches on the front of them and everything else. And the problem was you're lost in the desert. You have to find supplies for the following day. This was identified by a uh, pole in the desert with a white cloth on top of it, but we traveled only at night. When it started getting dark, we started out. We were trying to escape the enemy that had us trapped in the desert. And during that time, we went through the most unbelievable conditions. We were in an area where there were washes where the banks went nearly straight up and down, and we took those jeeps up and down those banks, um, you know, anchor them on something and then run the winch and the guys pushing and pulling on there. And we found the uh, white flag each time and uh, found our water and food and supplies for the following uh, days then. Um, did you Cactus in the desert grows in strange forms, and one of the forms that it grew in was the limb came off of the main body of the cactus plant, and it was nothing but solid um, spines. When they got dry, they broke off. And uh, again, I always traveled, I walked with Carly Tom, and even in combat we always walked together. And he was going down one of these steep slopes and he fell down and landed his butt right on top of one of his limbs. And uh, he was totally speared with uh, cactus spines. Was there any indication that your unit was going to be involved in, in operations in the desert or was just... No, we'll come to that on the next portion of here. Okay. So anyway, um, they held realistic things out there. We were past this uh, snake bite bit. One day we went out on a problem where um, there was a lot of uh, whatever it was, grease wood or whatever, desert plants anyway. And there was a uh, standing type foxhole dug in there and it was reinforced with um, sandbags. And the problem was to run through the grease wood and they had tip-up targets in there, and they had guys pulling on the ropes and make the target tip up. All live ammo, of course. And the problem was to uh, shoot the tip-up targets when the silhouette arose in front of you like an enemy. And then at the end of the run, you jumped into the uh, sandbag foxhole and they ran over you with a tank. <laughs> it, 
you know, nobody got hurt. But something did happen that day that I wrote to my mother about, and I have the letter to this day. A regular thermometer in the desert was worthless. It would make it, it wouldn't make it one day, because it was always over 120. And uh, one of the boys from Louisiana sent and had his wife send a cooking thermometer out to the desert. Now we did pick a slope where the sun hit that, and it was dark stones. We picked the hottest damn spot you could find, and we we put that cooking thermometer out there on top of those dark stones. It went to 162 degrees. If you set your canteen out in the sun, you better be careful about putting that thing up to your mouth. And if you were eating out there, we ate in the outside out there. Uh, the, uh, anyway, we ate outdoors. No danger of, of, of rain out in Camp Laguna, take my word for it. And you set your coffee out there and you got out the uh, sunny side of the coffee and sated the coffee until it got cool enough to be comfortable to drink. Um, I'm going to finish with uh, Camp Laguna here, one more yarn. Okay. I'm out in the field one day and one of the guys from my platoon went down to the supply sergeant and he picked up three candles for me. Nice guy. When I got back in, I walked into this tent, and here was my cut. It was all made up, of course, with that wool blanket stretched on there, and there were three white cords laying on top of the blanket. Uh, what in the devil is this? Then it dawned on me. This helpful soul laid those three candles on top of my wool blanket, and of course they melted and soaked into my wool blanket. And then when it got later on and it got cool at night, I had a spot about as big around as a bushel basket stiff as a board might have been soaked with, uh, with wax. That's a test of the temperature out there. Or the, it wasn't temperature so much. We took long hikes out there. We, we did our job out there. The training pro program went right on. Um, and it got more complicated and bigger until we were working uh, Regiment size okay. uh, problems, and uh, our regimental co uh, regimental commander and his uh, regimental exec were directing the battalions to do what would be helpful out there in combat later on. Um, yeah. So where did you go from the desert? On the fifth of December of 1943, we got on a train and went to Camp Phillips, Kansas for winter maneuvers. Of course, that follows, doesn't it? <laughs> we had excellent equipment. They issued to us what we should have had later on, top rubbers, rubber bottoms and uh, leather tops. And they had um, soak up type inner soles in those things and you changed them so that it kept the moisture from staying in there in your feet. And we had good wool socks, wool uniforms, the whole bit. And they gave us each a sleeping bag. And it was a downfill sleeping bag. And believe me, you could sleep outside. We slept out at 12 below one night I know of in Camp Phillips, Kansas, in the snow. So we did a winter maneuvers in Camp Phillips, Kansas. We got there the fifth. I think we left Laguna, Camp Laguna, on the 5th of December, and at whatever time it took to get over to Camp Phillips, that's when we moved into Camp Phillips, Kansas. And we had furloughs from there, 10 days. Before you began your winter maneuvers? I'm Be sorry? Before winter maneuvers? No, we finished winter maneuvers and then around Christmas time, well, about the time that we got in and got started nicely, they started giving furloughs. And then in January and February, then we did winter maneuvers okay. in uh, Kansas, in the snow out there. Kansas is a, that's quite a place. We, uh, we were near the city of Salina, Kansas. And uh, they had enough population there so that there were girls to dance with and stuff like that. There was none of that other stuff. That's, that's for civilians and guys that make 
draw comics in newspapers. But in real life, you may move 15,000 GIs into a camp, and uh, there are thousands of other GIs in there. I never was a guy. I never went to town from these camps. I never went to Stark, Florida, and I didn't go hardly ever to Salina, Kansas. I just didn't do that. I was busy around camp. I, being a platoon sergeant with 40 men, you know, you have to look after a few things. And uh, I want to inject right here what I think to be a true statement. I was a damn good soldier. I was never late. If the company fell out, I was there. If the company went out on a, on a 25 or 30 mile hike with full field pack, when they came in, I was there. I never fell out. Not one time. So in Camp Phillips, Kansas, and we finished up there, um, we pulled some nice problems there. Walking under our own artillery fire, we of course had regiment, had battalions of artillery that belonged to the 79th Infantry Division. They furnished walking artillery in the snow. The rounds went over the top of us and exploded in front of us. We simulated an attack. We, that's right, mm -hmm. we simulated an attack. And various other things out there. While we were out there, of course, during this time that elapsed from the time when I was in picket and became the platoon sergeant of the 3rd platoon, my platoon, of course, got worn down. Uh, broken arches, uh, sick, uh, transferred to another branch. Uh, they had uh, training programs there for guys that had good educations and they took them out and they uh, converted them to a better use than uh, working in the infantry. So by the time we got to Camp Phillips, Kansas, they replaced, they brought everybody up to the, the prescribed number. I was supposed to have uh, 40 men in my platoon. This was three squads of 12, 36, Bill Moore and myself, 38, and then I had a messenger and Lieutenant Combs had a messenger, so I had 40 enlisted men. But the entire platoon, of course, was the 41 men, but I had, obviously, Lieutenant Combs was the man. Um, Camp Phillips, Kansas was, um, it was just a. It was just a. It was good training too. It it furthered what the men had done in Blanding, Tennessee maneuvers, and uh, and Camp Laguna. And by the time we got done with Camp Phillips, Kansas, I guarantee you, this people, if you said attention, they did not flinch. They did not move around. They didn't shift their feet. They were just. They weren't. This wasn't a fear thing. This was a this was a um, cooperation type of thing. If you were the platoon sergeant, you said something. It wasn't screamed at him or anything else. By this time, it had developed into a thing where there was a certain amount of. Um, it wasn't true democracy. Now, let's not get crazy with this. But uh, you could, if if you were a, a platoon sergeant, and uh, in my platoon, if. If I suggested that something should be done this way, it just about got done that way. Well, it's a cohesive unit. Tell me again, please. It was a cohesive unit. That's right. Totally cohesive. In Camp Phillips, I pulled one of the old-style platoon sergeant deals. We'd fall out in the morning. It's cold as hell out there, you know. The other platoons would all be standing in line, and a couple of my guys are still coming out of the barracks. I got sick of this mess, and besides, the other platoon sergeants were giving me fits. Hey, we're all ready to standing at a terrace here in Hardrath platoon and all this baloney. So I said, Bill, Bill Moore, I said, Bill, get your pad and pencil. You stand by the door. The last one out is the first guy that goes on detail. <laughs> Don't stand in that door when that whistle blew, because they would they would run over you. I'm telling you, they, 
tearing out of that door to get out there and line up. I did not have any problem with my platoon being out there and being on time from then on. But that wasn't my way of doing things. The guys in my platoon thought it was sort of comical, laughing and running out there. <laughs> the old Sarge is lowering the boom on us. Well, how long were you in Kansas? We got there probably like the 10th or 12th of December of 1943, and we left there, and this I'm not, I can't pinpoint this, we left there for the East Coast, an obvious transfer to the European side. Along in uh, um, I'm going to guess that it was probably in March. Okay. I'm going to take a break here just yeah. for a second, okay? You're heading to the East Coast. Yeah. We left our camp in Kansas and went over to uh, Camp Miles Standish, which is near Boston. And um, we were only there a matter of days. Uh, it was a mad time of checking everybody's equipment, being sure that our guys were ready. And um, my battalion was assigned to go to the ship first, which is lying in Boston Harbor. And uh, it was a British cruise liner. And being that we were the first ones to board the ship, we boarded probably five or six days ahead of the main body of the men coming in. And uh, we were lucky enough to get on there and we got a, a cabin up near the top of the ship. Very nice. Of course, they had converted this so that what should have had two people in it had about eight or nine, ten people in it. But it was nice. Um, and then the men boarded the ship. And um, we left and we were surrounded. This was a big convoy. And we crossed in, in the convoy style, and there, the speedy boats were running around in that convoy all the time. Uh, I'm not aware that there was a submarine around. The, of course, among the GIs, you know, there was a submarine around and all that type of thing. But I'm not aware <clears throat> of a submarine being around us. It's interesting to note that uh, we had nothing but 79th Infantry Division guys on there, except for the British crew, of course. But one of the um, levels of what had been um, where the uh, passengers were along one of these uh, uh, hallways was occupied entirely by uh, second lieutenant nurses, and they were heading for the battle area also. And uh, so we had a, a regular, a rather, um, it wasn't, it wasn't a, it wasn't the kind of a thing that was, a, it was just, routine, it was a routine crossing as far as I know. How many days did it take? I don't know. Okay. 10, 12, whatever. But it, um, it's, a, it's a guess on my part. And where did you land? Where did you arrive? Scotland. We landed in the Firth of something or other, but I can't Firth remember. Firth of Forth? Um, <laughs> anyway, we got into trucks there and we went to a field in England. And there were pyramidal tents there, cold, miserable, wet. Um, and of course there was no room for maneuvers there. By this time, it was getting warm in the States, but in England it still had that cold, uh, wet feeling. I developed pneumonia there. And they put me in the hospital. And then a ambulance, an ambulance took me back to the company area from the hospital. And when I got there, they told me at company headquarters that the rest of my company was doing a forced march back in 
or movement immediately away. And of course, this was getting down toward the end of May. So, um, was it being moved because of the conditions to get away from? No. We went down there, and of course, we were really in a holding thing in the camp that we occupied. But the move, of course, was down to the south coast of England. Huh. And uh, the trains, and we wound up in southern England on a place called Lipe Hill. Why the hell I remember that, I'll never know. But anyway, this was the kind of brush that the uh, sage hens, whatever they had in England, lived in. And uh, we spent a few nights in, on Lipe Hill. Again, I'm sharing a pup tent with my uh, platoon guide, William L. Moore, Jr. And about two or three o'clock in the morning, on the morning of, De of, uh, Jan of, um, June. of June 6th, there was a constant roar going on outside of that tent. I got up and sat out there in the brush, looking up at a, two solid layers of aircraft in the sky. And I woke up Bill Moore and we sat out there and watched this. This was truly a, an historic scene. The uh, aircraft in the top layer were the aircraft that were returning from dropping their paratroopers into, com to com into combat in Normandy. Some, um, this probably was 4, 30, 5 o'clock in the morning by now, but after midnight they started dropping them into Normandy. And the bottom layer was entirely four motor stuff. And each one of them on a, a nylon rope was towing a glider. And they had the glider troops in these gliders and they were pulling them across to land in uh, the northern coast, along the northern coast of France, in those fields. And I want to point out that the Germans had done a lot of preparation. With all that slave labor they had, or whatever they did, they cut all those trees down and cut off about a 30-foot section of the trunk. And then they laid the field out and dug holes in there like you're digging in a, um, a power pole. And they staggered them in such a manner there's no way to land a glider in there because you're bound to run into one of these poles that are stuck in the ground. It was a diabolical piece of business, but they had done a job of it. They didn't do a good job on all the fields, so some of the gliders got in just fine. So we went down to southern England. I, I don't have my notes with me, but uh, on the evening of the 11th, on the 10th we went, we landed uh, then, off, got off the train then on the southern coast of England on a departure area. And our ship was lying off there, and this was an American uh, Navy uh, transport vessel. And uh, we boarded the ship on the night, evening of the 11th. And uh, this had been used on D-Day. And uh, they got all the non-coms, ranking non-coms, and the officers together because they were in a big table in there in a common area. They had a uh, sand table rigged up, showing you exactly what the, every detail of the beach was on there. And so on the morning of the 12th of June, 1944, six mornings after D-Day, our ship was, uh, the sun was coming up and we were anchored off of Utah Beach. This is where the 4th Infantry Division went in. And it was a nice morning. Sun was shining. The um, Navy pulled their LCI alongside, landing craft infantry alongside, and it was bumping up against the side of the ship. Not very large waves, but it was a nice warm morning. They had this rope net hung over the rail on the edge of the main deck, and that net then reached down in, and when they pulled up there with an LCI, they pulled that inside of the LCI. And the job was to, and we had all of our combat equipment on now. No full field pack, light pack, ammo belt, loaded with ammo, everything. Raffle on your shoulder. Um, 
and over the rail you go and into the net and down the net into the LCI. And uh, I had a man in my platoon. He was a uh, storekeeper from Kansas. Wonderful man. He just wasn't daring and he couldn't go down that net. And uh, I said, here, Dubsky, give me your rifle. I'll take your rifle down. So Dubsky went down without a rifle and um, he followed me and I took a rifle on each shoulder and went down the net. I'm bragging a little bit, but that's what happened. And we went up and the, uh, this child, sailor, of course, <laughs> running this LCI, ran us up on the sand and this, this door went down and hit into the sand. <laughs> Out your rear end goes. Uh, it was nice. The water was probably something above your knees. Waited in. And um, assembled on the beach. My platoon quickly formed up into platoon uh, formation. And the company formed up and we took off and walked off into uh, France. I think the beachhead was uh, probably about uh, six to eight miles deep by this time. And so there was no fire on the beach. Their artillery firing over their own men couldn't reach that. They didn't have the range. So there was no fire of any kind on the beach. And all I saw there was a net wire uh, enclosure with about 40 or 50 German POWs sitting in there looking uh, like nondescript bums. <laughs> At least I thought that's what they looked like. Um, There was an odd thing on that beach. The Germans had concocted some of the damnedest things together that you've ever seen, and one of them was a miniature tank. The tracks and everything, driven electrically, made electricity down on the beach and this electric motor in this thing, of course it was full of uh, high explosives. <clears throat> the idea was to, the controller ran this thing out on the beach when the guys were landing and explode this thing but it was sitting there intact. Outside of that, I don't remember anything truly dramatic about the beach, except that behind there, there was a huge um, giant, what do you call the sand dune, it was a sand hill is what it was. This is what raised so much hell. The 4th Infantry Division didn't really have that much trouble going in. Later on, I talked with a guy from the 4th that went in on the morning of D-Day. He said they just only had six casualties that morning, which was, Almost, we call that as almost nothing. Yeah. yeah. So when we, um, having been formed up why we just walked inland, we walked right past the little town of St. Mir Eglise, the one that had the, um, the thing in the movie and all that junk. And we walked in probably five miles and dug in. We took a few rounds of artillery that night but it didn't hit anybody. We were all dug in. So we didn't have any casualties the first day. Can you spell that for me? That town? S-T. M-E-R-A. Uh, we called it St. Marie Eglise. It was, oh, yeah. let's call it M-E-R-E, E-G-L-I-S-E. -E. That would make sense. Yeah, St. Marie Eglise. Uh, we stayed there then. And of course, I'm in a strange land, and uh, Carly Tallman and I were a pair of damn tourists. The day after we uh, dug in and took those artillery rounds, we didn't have anything to do, so we toured the countryside. Why I didn't think about landmines, I will never know, but I didn't. So we walked around where all of the paratroopers and gliders landed. The British had a horse glider made out of wood and glue. And in that thing, they carried a jeep and an anti-tank gun. And they had a couple of, obviously if they pressed a button in that thing, the back of the uh, entire, this was a big aircraft, a glider. And uh, some exploding bolts in there and the tail fell off and fell on the ground. And they could just back the jeep and the, uh, or drive the jeep and the anti-tank gun out. 
they had uh, things in there that they put down. They drove the jeep and they had a tank gun out. Well, the area that, that the tourists walked through, me and Carly Tallman, one of the poor devils came in at least 50 feet too low and the tall trees in the hedgerows around those fields in France, they hit those things about 40, 50 feet above the ground and that thing turned to matchwood in the air. And all that was laying there they, was a wrecked jeep and a destroyed anti-tank gun and a guy's hand. But outside of that, um, by this time all the casualties had been picked up by our uh, grave registration units. In the corner of one of those fields was 14 gliders. They found a place where a glider could land and obviously the fellows piloting these gliders knew how to find a field uh, and uh, they would land in the field and then the guys obviously jumped out and pushed them tight together in the corner of the field. So there were 14 gliders in the corner of a single field there. One of the horse gliders, these were big. The outside skin was so thin that, of course, Tallman and I, the tourists, we actually rammed our fist through the side of the fuselage on this thing. The wood on the outside was that thin. The, we went back to the unit and we stuck around there in these, uh, the rest of our division had to arrive. Or uh, we didn't wait for the artillery. We replaced the 90th Infantry Division, which had been in about four or five days, and they were totally decimated. Um, for the first few days that we were in combat, we used the 90th Division, 90th Division artillery, and then our own our own artillery came in, and of course we used them. From here, you want me to go on now with into the combat stage. Sure, sure. Yes. We probably stuck around there about four days and then we were ready to go. So, you know, the line of departure and all of this nomenclature that they had attached to combat stuff. So the my company and my battalion, my regiment moved up to the line of departure, you know, two battalions forward, one battalion reserve, triangular division thing. Uh, the battalion had two companies forward and one reserve, and my platoon had two squads forward and one squad in reserve. We moved out and moved through the 90th Infantry Division. They were dug in for the night. And this was just cracking daylight nicely. Off to my left was one of those famous um, French hedgerows. A, diabol a diabolical contraption if you ever saw one for an infantryman. And one of the platoon sergeants from the 90th Infantry Division came over and was talking. Uh, Lieutenant Combs and I were walking together and he came over and talked to us. He said, have your men dig in and then dig under because they're going to explode their rounds in the trees above you. And he said, they'll get you in your, uh, in your uh, foxhole, no, in your slit trench below. And I said, y'all have been in now for four days, I think it was four days. I said, what about casualties? He said, 86. Boy, that's heavy. I said, okay, out of the 86, how many of them were complete casualties, dead? He said, 14. And my, <laughs> my mathematics rolled around in my mind a little bit and it dawned on me. You know, even if you get hit, the odds of making it are not that bad. You can make it. Just because you get hit doesn't necessarily mean you're dead. From then on, we advanced, of course, and my platoon did not have very serious combat the first day. I don't think that they fired too many rounds, tell you the truth about it. I fired the first round myself that was fired in C Company in combat. Uh, it sticks in my mind, it was a little a village by the name of Angoville, A-N-G-O-V-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. And behind each house in there was a small yard fenced in with a tall stone fence. And this was full of the biggest rabbits I've ever seen in my life in that yard back there. And Carly Tallman and I were 
behind this stone wall. Of course, like anybody in the infantry with brains enough to be alive, you got behind you you'd get behind the stone wall, wouldn't you? I got to looking over there at the Catholic Church. Of course, it's French Catholic, and the slats around the uh, bell and up in the uh, bell steeple. And I said, Tolman, this looks like a German helmet sticking up there in those slats. They were just two, we were perfectly concealed. And he took a look up there and he said, let him have it. So I took a dead aim on this thing and pulled the trigger. It was not a German soldier. I know because Captain Hill, of course, our company commander, Alvin C. Hill, a principal man, ordered one of the other platoon leaders to take, <laughs> to take a, a unit and uh, take, pick some men and go on over and check out that church and be sure we didn't have a uh, German artillery spotter up there because we were well aware that you find a high spot you most likely find an artillery spotter up there with his phones and wires and so forth. So anyway, my guys, I don't think I did not have a casualty the first day. But we dug in along a flat field for the night, getting dark now, and digging our slit trenches along a, a hedgerow, of course. And some SOB was firing on us all the time. And there was a nice sized tree at the end of the field, and I figured that sounds to me like that firing coming from that field, from that uh, tree. And. Uh, Bunny Feldner was one of my uh, BAR guys. I had three BAR teams. Each team is a three-man team. One guy carries the BAR. They all three carry ammo for the BAR, which took a hell of a lot of ammo. And these were 20-round clips. Are you familiar with the BAR? Mm -hmm. The little thing on there where you can make them full automatic or semi-automatic. And I said, Feldner, go on up there and rake up and down that tree. I went up there with him. He fired a whole bunch of rounds up and down the bowl of that tree, and I could hear it dripping on the leaves below. His chairman sniper was up in that tree, and he killed him up there. But he had a belt around the tree, or a limb or something, and he didn't fall out. The following morning when I got up, I went over and took a look at that situation again. He had a bicycle down uh, hidden in the brush at the base of the tree. And in there he had a tin compartment that fit into the frame of the bicycle. And we looked in there and it had civilian clothes in it. His job was to kill a bunch of Americans as a sniper, come down the tree, dress in the civilian clothes and be a French farmer and ride away. Well, of course, that didn't quite work. Um, the next morning, I got a lesson in German tactics. Remember now, they'd been in war since 39, and a lot of those birds in the German army had a hell of a lot of experience in combat. Our men set up a 57 millimeter anti-tank gun at a curve in a blacktop road that came right close to where we were dug in. And like all guys, you know, I walked over to talk to the anti-tank guys. They had the you know, trails out, you know, and they had it braced in the ground and all that kind of a thing. And there was a curve in the road there, and they set below the curve so that they could shoot straight up that road. Dead sight. And as I was walking over there, these fellows were sitting on those trails, BSing, of course, and all of a sudden a rifle shot rang out, and one of them keeled over, dead as a mackerel. And here there was a discarded piece of road building equipment over there and the weeds and trash underneath there was three, four feet high. And out from underneath that road grader, there came a German soldier with his hands up. And we took him prisoner. Well, later on, guess what I found out? That was a modus operandi in the German army. If you're trapped, kill a German, kill an American, then come up with your hands out and surrender. And I'm no longer with the German army, but they're one short too. Well, I understand that later on, after I got hit, that our officers put a stop to that baloney. If he comes, if he shoots at an American first and then comes out with his hands up, when he comes out, 
down he goes. That's the way that wound up. And that's, that's the way it should be. If you're going to surrender, surrender, but don't kill an American first. So that's the way that wound up. And while I'm standing out there, the guy had already been killed. Three of these tiny, I think these are all what had been one, one time French tags. They were like a, they were like something out of a cartoon. They came waddling down the road, little old things, you know, with these trap doors on the side where the guys could climb out. Three of them, one behind the other one. Our guys on that 57 millimeter fired twice, and two of those things blew up. The third guy, seeing what was happening, he ran into the ditch, and there was a steep bank on the other side, and he ran up there, and the damn thing tipped over on the right-hand side. <laughs> These guys came piling out of there like mad, ran into the brush, and those German soldiers were gone. That was my second morning. That was a serious day in combat. We were heading for Cherbourg now, the Cherbourg Peninsula, six out into the British Channel, English Channel. And our job was to go up and capture the city of Cherbourg with its major port in France. This is something that all of our commanders knew we had to have. General Marshall, President Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, Dwight Eisenhower knew that we had to have a port to get all of that equipment into France that it's going to take to support all of these armies that we put in there. And uh, so we formed up and started up the peninsula. It was, I don't rem I never knew how long it was from where the uh, land formed into the peninsula up to the city of Cherbourg. It's a pretty nice sized city. But when you got up toward the end of the um, peninsula. It wasn't very wide. Again, I don't know the number of miles. Probably six, seven, eight miles wide. We formed up three divisions abreast. We did. They did. I'm, I'm walking along. I'm a platoon sergeant. They put the 4th the, uh, Infantry Division on our right, the 9th Infantry Division on our left, and the 79th carried the middle of this wrestle. And we started, before we started, we learned that one of our units from the 79th had crossed over to the, um, the uh, western side of the peninsula and got all the way to the water. We had the peninsula cut. Germans north of us on that entire peninsula, thousands of them were trapped. So we started north into this fracas. The Germans were prepared. They had taken an area in there and bulldozed it absolutely flat. There was no knoll, no tree, no nothing. And in there they put these inland forts that were beyond belief uh, under the ground entrances where you could drive trucks into. They had supplies. They, each one of these inland forts contained an 88 millimeter field piece, a rifle if you please. Fantastic muscle, muzzle velocity, 4,200 feet per second. And our rifle only fired 3,900 feet per second. So you can imagine what that sounded like to get shot at by an 88 millimeter German uh, gun. And we got up to that area that had been, they cleared it from, from water to water all the way across the peninsula. And we were, had to make our way through that. How that happened absolutely escapes me. We got up to the cleared area and we battled there for a day. Our tanks went out on there and um, they would drive around. The, the machine gun emplacements there, remember that these were all connected by deep trenches so they could walk around from unit to unit. Um, machine gun emplacements and so forth, all made out of concrete with a steel door in the back. And I'm standing there behind a hedgerow, like any good infantryman, you know, <laughs> looking out. While the tank out there, one of our tanks is out there, he was about a dozen uh, GIs from the 79th trotting along with his tank. He'd pull up behind that 
machine gun emplacement, cement with that door, and he'd lower that 75 and <laughs> fire some armor piercing against that door, and if they were still alive in there, they came out. And uh, there I saw a strange sight. At the end of the hedgerow, our medics were working on wounded. We had a hell of a lot of wounded there, Germans and Americans. And the German uh, captain was there, the doctor, with all of his men, his medics. And he had a couple of uh, boxes that were about the size of an American uh, foot locker. And they had all their equipment in there. And all of our American doctors and medics were there with them, a bunch of them. And they were doctoring these wounded guys indiscriminately. The German doctors worked on Americans, the American doctors worked on wounded Germans, whatever came in. Hmm. That's not the kind of a thing I expected. But that's what, that's what I saw. Um, being at the edge of that one evening, it, was, it started, uh, it got dark in the middle of, and in the middle of the night we started across that, that graded down area. The only explanation I had the next day and the days after that is one that I still hold to this day. These guys must have been damn poor soldiers in there, German soldiers. I think they all went to bed. We just walked through and got to the north side of this thing and walked out of it. And we were only about three or four miles south of Cherbourg on a paved highway at a crossroads. And my guys, the next day, we held where we were. My guys were taking it easy. I mean, this business of being out there all night walking through this fortified area. And of course, we, we expected the Germans to come on and, and tie into us in a counterattack. But our artillery laid down a cover for the, uh, specifically in front of my platoon. My platoon was off to the right of a uh, blacktop road that led straight to Cherbourg. And our artillery, uh, if you left the third platoon and walked toward the enemy, probably a matter of um, three or four hundred yards, you came to a draw there that was full of woods and brush. And of course, we expected the Germans to move in there and then come out and give us Holy Hill. So our artillery arched this artillery over our heads and exploded that stuff in that uh, line of brush in front of my platoon. There was never a moment when you didn't hear, you could hear, could not hear, you could hear, always hear three or four rounds whistling and jiggling over your head with these artillery round sounds. And it, Wait a minute, that's the morning we arrived and it was still dark. And they laid the fire down in the darkness. Bill Moore and I dug a standing type foxhole by the light of exploding artillery rounds. That many rounds they were dropping out ahead of us to discourage these birds from coming in and tackling us. During that night I went over to where the crossroad was, where the east and west road, crossed the north and south road that went straight up to the city of Cherbourg, which was our, our destination. And I was standing near that road, and uh, our regimental commander was standing there. And from the north, from Cherbourg, came the putt, putt, putt of a murder, motorcycle. And of course, he came out down, he was he wasn't going very fast. He only had that little blinker light on there, you know, to use in a blackout. And of course, the uh, full colonel standing there with his 45, he bellered, halt. This guy revved up the engine, and in the excitement, he ran into the ditch and the thing tipped over, and our colonel jerked the 45 out and killed him right on the spot with 45. What a deal. He was coming down, he didn't know we were up there. He was going to go down into that fortified area and check on his men. I don't know what he was doing, but that's where he was headed for. And he, uh, his motorcycle tipped over in the ditch and our girl shot him. 
We stuck around there the following day and the next morning we attacked, of course we attacked, towards Cherbourg. We made it about halfway up there and we ran into artillery that you could not possibly describe. The only thing the save does, my platoon, was that we were going up a hill so steep that these high velocity stuff that they were using, they couldn't arch them enough to get at us. If they lowered their guns enough, they hit the tip of the uh, hill in front of us and they exploded up there in front of us a couple hundred yards. And if they uh, fired them high enough, they jumped over the top of the hill and exploded in the valley below. We wound up deserting the advance we had made and double timed back to my standing fight tower, standing type foxhole. And on the way, we overran one of their 88 millimeter rifles. That took care of that. Then the following day, we took off in the attack, and this time we were supported properly and so forth. A lot of more men came up. Remember, we were just an outfit that was up there by ourselves, and we were cut off the next day. Um, our regimental commander took some of my men and went back through the German lines. I've forgotten how many men that my, my men from my platoon told me that he killed. He had deserted his 45 by this time and picked up an M1. But he was killing Germans himself, a full colonel out there shooting German soldiers. You know his name? I'm sorry? Do you know the name of the colonel? No, I don't. I don't remember his name. He later on developed some kind of a, of a um, ailment. I think he developed battle fatigue, if you want. I don't know, but I don't remember his name. He, um, he finally uh, went off to the hospital and simply disappeared, and the regimental exec, Colonel Van Bibber, took over the regiment. We got up toward Cherbourg in the outskirts of Cherbourg. It was a nice sized town. And uh, there was a hell of a lot of Luftwaffe men up there. They were anti-aircraft guys, but the anti-aircraft in the German uh, army belonged to the uh, Air, Air Force. We captured all, all of them, hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, Cherbourg was a strange place to uh, conquer. First of all, of course, it was the headquarters for that entire section of France for the German army. And so there was a big hotel up there, and that contained all the officers that belonged to a headquarters outfit for the German army. And uh, we got to the outskirts of Cherbourg, and uh, Bill Moore and I went up a small hill and went through a uh, explored a uh, forced labor camp that was up there, deserted now. They had hauled the people out of there, the laboring people. And I got about, I think about 15,000 visitors up there. I walked around in there. You cannot <clears throat> imagine the number of fleas I picked up in that, in that German labor camp. Following morning, we uh, attacked the city of Cherbourg itself through the outskirts. Um, and that was a day that, that I became something that could be part of, it really became part of a history book later on. My platoon had the right side of a main artery running straight into the city of Cherbourg and it went and wound up right at the seawall. And I had my third platoon on the right hand side and another platoon of C Company had the left-hand side of the same street. And we proceeded through the city of Cherbourg, and a lot of that was four-story apartment buildings and so forth. I didn't have hardly any casualties that day at all. The fact of the matter is I think I had one guy killed. When we got up to the seawall, this was some distance from the dock area, from the docks itself. Um, Within minutes, of course, the, all the newspapers had their reporters up there, you know, Cherbourg is taken and all this kind of stuff. And um, interviewed by the Chicago Tribune and I don't know what all. Um, 
Off to our left was the hotel, probably two blocks away. This housed all of these uh, German officers that ran the whole show. And out of that, the uh, battalion to our left captured the commanding general of the entire area. I'm out of paper again. <laughs> Um, all of the officers out of the hotel in Cherbourg came out and put their packs. They intended to be rescued by sea, of course. But of course the Germans couldn't get in there because our air forces absolutely would have knocked them cold. So they couldn't get in there and rescue their officers. And so the general remained there and all of the other guys. They each had a giant pack prepared to take home to Mama and the kids. Baby shoes, silk stockings, sausage, you name it. There must have been, on front of the hotel, like a hundred of these giant packs that they had prepared waiting out there. Um, my battalion commander used a man in my platoon as an interpreter. This fellow's name was Macht a German from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and uh, he spoke excellent German. So my lieutenant colonel used him. And uh, when they interviewed the general, who surrendered, of course, Hitler told him, he, you know, fight to the last man and all that stuff, but he found some good reason to surrender. So he surrendered to my outfit, specifically to a, uh, another uh, battalion in, in my uh, uh, regiment. And a uh, little sidelight on something like this. Mach stole the general's fountain pen and gave it to me. So <laughs> that's the way it went. And uh, we spent then one night in the city of Cherbourg. And um, we, we just picked an apartment. This town was totally deserted. You understand that the Germans didn't want the Frenchmen around at all. And they put up signs accordingly, in French, of course. You better be out of here by a given time, on a given date. They knew that the Americans were going to be in there, and they didn't want those Frenchmen around. They suspected they were going to help the Americans, which, of course, they would have. So anyway, they had those signs plastered all over the towns that we went through in France. Um, the following day, they didn't waste any time. They loaded us all on trucks. I want to add one thing from the human side of this. That hotel had more wine and champagne in it than any place you could possibly imagine. And we had damn good commanding officers. And they said, each company send your Jeep by with an empty trailer. And they loaded those trailers up and said, <laughs> the town had fallen in the middle of the afternoon. And so what did these guys do? They started whacking away at this wine and champagne. And I did too. So the following morning we loaded up in trucks. We headed south to where the combat was taking place now, heading for St. Lo. And um, this was different kind of combat. This was against truly tough German soldiers. Lots of artillery, lots of mortars. And lots of those rapid-fire machine guns. We got into it. This this can just be told as something that that was just took place over a matter of a couple of weeks. And my men were fighting in there, worn out, starving tired on their feet. They could hardly walk. Our kitchens did not come along from England, and so for the month that I lasted, I never ate a meal. I lived on D-bars and K-rations, and sometimes your entire ration for the day were three D-bars, which was like a uh, small um, chocolate bar. 
It had all the uh, good stuff in there, vitamins and whatever they said. But it sure as hell wasn't much. And uh, I lived for the month. I lasted a month. I lived for that month on uh, K rations and D bars. And of course, my stomach got so small you cannot imagine. I lost a lot of weight. All my men looked like tough young men. They were either tough as hell or they were out of it. We fought down into the area then that was being, uh, we tried to overcome and get down to St. Lowe and break out. We knew that. When you say break out. Yes, break out and uh, go over to St. Lowe and that's what finally happened. So you're finally getting out of the They broke through the German room. lines and they started in with uh, the tanks yeah. and they tore into the uh, German held areas yeah. in France and later on my outfit went all the way over to uh, Belgium. They sometimes make 40, 50, 60 miles in a day. On the 4th of July, we were ordered to fire our weapons at noon. We'd been in combat since the moment we got off the trucks. They put us into combat again. Um, on the 4th of July, they ordered us to fire us all of our weapons at noon as a sort of a celebration type thing. And uh, I guess remind the Germans that there was a hell of a lot of people out there with a little ammo. On the morning of the 5th of July, we went after a hill. This was a high, commanding hill that looked all the way back to the city of La Haye de Puy and all the way over to the ocean. And this was on the, um, on the west side of this piece of land that we were going through and it wound up in the water. This was um, I cannot believe that I'm not spitting out the name of that hill. That was the curse of my outfit. Or you'll have to look for it, my eyes are bad. Here, Lori. It was um, Mont Garden, M O N T E G A R T E N. Mont Garden. Yeah. Bloody hill. We approached this uh, hill of Mont Garden. And um, I recall it so well because by this time I had a couple of weeks in. And. Uh, I was, I was well broken into this business. I had a hell of a bunch of casualties already. And uh, I was walking along beside Captain Hill. Captain Hill had gotten that to a tanker somewhere and got himself an old style Chicago submachine, 45 caliber submachine gun with the round uh, uh, container on the bottom for the ammo. We're walking off a uh, grade through an open field toward a set of really nice set of, set of farm buildings. Turned out to be a dairy farm. And with his 45 uh, machine uh, uh, gun, he was firing bursts of fire into these buildings. Uh, you know. We got over the buildings and they weren't occupied. We took over there and then we went into the hollow below and they're separating us, separating us from Mont Garden was a long, this was over near the coast, and this had been a swamp at some time, probably most of a half a mile across, maybe less. But these, these French, during this, this was old farm country, had been farmed for hundreds and hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years. Um, they had dug a drainage ditch through this low land we were on, uh, on a high rising area above the farm buildings, but around the farm buildings you headed downhill and headed onto this perfectly level, low land. And on the other side of the low land was this high commanding hill, Mont Garden. We took the battalion in there and they started to cross through this low land. There was a big wheat field in the bottoms there, and on one side of the wheat field was a ditch. It was probably five or six feet deep. 
and probably six feet wide at the top with straight up and down walls. Obviously hand dug hundreds of years before. Our guys started attacking that and that's the day that C Company was in battalion reserve. Thank you, Lord. And the guys out ahead of us, from the guns on top of Mont Garden, looking right down their throats, and looking at us over in the farm buildings across that flat land, absolutely slaughtered the battalion down in those, uh, down in the woods. The, the wide wheat field reaching all the way over to Mont Garden, then the big ditch, drainage ditch, and then on the right hand side of the drainage ditch, from our perspective, heavy woods. Of course they went down the drainage ditch, and of course the Germans with the trees hanging over the drainage ditch, they put their artillery in those trees, and the guys got absolutely slaughtered. A couple of days later, I talked with my great friend from battalion headquarters company, headquarters company 1st Battalion, and Chris Gooch with headquarters company, he was a staff sergeant with headquarters company 1st Battalion. And he told me that the 1st Battalion took 45% casualties in that day. In other words, when you started out that morning, you were flipping a coin. Am I going to be here this evening? Um, but my, my company was uh, in reserve around that set of uh, farm buildings. What I did during the day was they brought in a um, battle fatigue fellow. He was uh, totally out of it. He couldn't stand, he couldn't walk, he couldn't talk, he could scream. And if an artillery round went over, that's what he did. So we found an old discarded bed there and we held him down. That was part of my job. Later on I went over to a smokehouse over on one side of this set of farm buildings and I'm sitting behind this uh, stone structure. And one of our forty from Weapon Platoon, C Company, and of course I knew everybody at C Company. They came over with a 60 millimeter mortar and they were sitting it up in front of a, uh, an apple tree about uh, 100 feet from me. They got the thing assembled, but before they dropped in the first round, the Germans put an 88 millimeter round over there and hit the tree behind them. But that fantastic velocity, velocity carried the fragments with it. And it, it knocked every one of them flat on their face but it didn't hit one of them, and it didn't hit me either, uh, sitting 100 feet or so away. They needed all kinds of places for our doctors, our battalion uh, medics to operate there, so they took over the uh, milking end of the dairy barn. They covered the floor with hay, and that's where they brought them in on the stretchers. And of course, with that number of casualties, they medics couldn't begin to carry the wounded in, in anywhere near fast enough. So we talked it over, and the guys in my platoon then volunteered to go into that hell and carry stretchers and bring back wounded. We did not touch the dead, you know. My outfit, if they were laying there dead, we just walked past them. We didn't go through their pockets, nothing. My guys were carrying wounded out, and believe it or not, I did not have a casualty that day. They went into that hell for endless trips, and not one of them got hit. Later on, I'm over near the aid station in that dairy barn, and one of the guys that I had given basic training to, during our time in Blanding, I gave a course of basic training. This is one of my men. Here he came walking toward the aid station, and he was holding his left hand in his right hand and he had the blood pinched off but the hand was missing and he was walking along with just as cool walking along without that hand damnedest thing he ever saw some of the guys died in the aid station they stacked them out at the end of the barn and there was a stack of them out there that was a ghastly day you cannot imagine. Essentially half of my battalion got knocked off, or what was left of them got knocked off in a single day. So I had my platoon around the farm building and it turned dark and then it st they stopped firing on both sides. 
our artillery stopped. Their artillery off of Mount Garden stopped. And it was the kind of an evening that I was used to in Wisconsin. No airplanes, no cars, no buses, no nothing out in the country. Perfectly still. And the moon came up and it was brilliantly light. It was almost like daylight. And I took my platoon down below the barn where there was a cow lane down there and I spread them out. And in case these Germans decided to come up there and clean us up, clean a, you know, attack during the night, I spread my platoon out along this cow lane near the barn. And I'm sitting down there with them. It was probably around midnight. And from way to hell off toward Mount Garden, in the area that we had been in and now deserted, we came back all the way. All of our guys came out of the battle area. And from way out there where we had been, up there near Mount Garden, came this call, help, help. And I, oh shit, I don't need this. I, I made it through this day, man. And I'm sitting there and one of the guys from C Company came along, we were talking about it. He said, hard rat, somebody ought to go out there and see if they can find that wounded guy out there that's calling for help. I didn't have the heart to send one of my sergeants out there. I said, oh, hell, I'll just go myself. So I picked out a PFC from my platoon and I said, come on along, we're going to go and see if we can find that guy that's wounded out there. We walked up through the woods beside the uh, drainage ditch and I, you know, we'd been on maneuvers in the woods already for a year and a half or whatever. Worked our way up through the woods and I said, I think that we've gone about far enough. So we crossed the drainage ditch into the, into the wheat field and walked along beside that drainage ditch. And I said, I think we might be far enough. Uh, I'm gonna, you cover me and I'll jump down in the ditch and see what I see in here. Do you know that the guy down in that ditch was the luckiest dog that ever walked the face of the earth? Where I jumped in there, there they were. Three of them sitting with their feet in the water in the bottom of the ditch and their head over up against that bank. I reached over and picked up one's hand, stiff as a board. He'd been dead a long time and I picked up the next one, stiff. I picked up the third hand, warm and limber. I called to the guy standing up there waiting for me, the PFC. I said, I got him, found him. And I said, you know, we got to have a stretcher up here. We got to have some more men. So I said, you run back to the company and get Tom and a couple of men and some stretcher and a stretcher. And I'll cover the, the uh, guy down in the ditch. So like any good infantryman, I, he ran off, double timing back to the set of farm buildings. I got into the uh, wheat field and I crawled a U in the, in the wheat field and I crawled back to near the edge of the ditch and kicked off the safety on my rifle and waited because they heard this guy calling too. I wasn't in there. I bet I didn't wait 10 minutes. And I heard the twigs and leaves cracking across the ditch in the woods. And of course, before they even talked in German with each other, I knew exactly what the hell was across the ditch for me, maybe 50 feet away. But M1 was a hell of a good rifle, and I had eight rounds, you know, they come through that ditch, I was going to give them a bad time, so anyway. Um, I just stayed there, and they never did come through the ditch. I could hear them across there, twigs cracking and stuff like that. And after a while, I hear Tom calling from way down toward the farm buildings. Hey, Sergeant, you know, and I, I wanted to scare these guys off too, so I hollered back. And here he came with a stretcher and uh, three men. And, and um, I jumped out of the ditch and grabbed this guy and boosted him up, and they grabbed in and got his hands, and they pulled him out into the moonlight, put him on that stretcher. I took a look at him. Hey, the most terrible looking sight you've ever seen. He'd been hit in the head, it had gone through his helmet. Uh, usually a tree burst above him, and the blood had run over his face, especially the right side, you know, all afternoon and half the night, and it clotted on him. God, he looked like something out of a horror movie, this fellow. I don't want nothing to do, I don't even want to see the guy. Remember that a wounded man was not exactly a novelty to me anymore. 
So anyway, two of the guys grabbed the stretcher and Tallman walked up ahead with his rifle and I kicked off the side. I walked behind with my rifle. And off to our right front in this wheat field, walking diagonally away from us, was four German soldiers. Warfare is weird. In this brilliant moonlight, you could see them just as plain as day. They didn't fire. We didn't fire. They disappeared off to our right front into a patch of woods over there. And we walked back to the barn with the guy with the hole in his head. We put him on a stretcher. I mean, on a jeep. Put the stretcher on the hood of a jeep when we got back to the aid station. They were getting out of there. And I walked over and looked at a body on the back of a jeep and it was our battalion commander. Our battalion commander, a lieutenant colonel, had been hit badly in his first week of combat after all that training, and he never did come back. I don't know what, how badly, he was hit badly. And uh, our battalion exec took over the battalion. This was a prince of a man. He came up from the ranks private all the way up to major. Phil Lofink, L-O-F-I-N-K. He and all the battalion uh, staff had that morning before the attack on Mount Garden gotten them. Officers can be stupid too. <laughs> they, they all got around a giant oak tree and they stood there and the goddamn Germans were looking right at them. And of course the Germans put around in the um, tree and either killed or wounded every officer of the 1st Battalion and it killed Phil Lofink. They were surveying across that flat over to the uh, objective and um, Finally, the, the, we had a staff sergeant in uh, uh, Headquarters Company 1st Battalion who effectively took over the battalion uh, direction until a, uh, uh, a captain from, uh, from regiment came down and took over the 1st Battalion. Well, whatever happened to the fellow that you brought oh, back? Oh, the fellow on the Jeep? Well, that you went out and got and you, that you found out in the... I didn't know his name. I couldn't see his dog. I wasn't interested in his name anyway. He was just another GI, wounded GI, there hundreds of them around. So in 1955 or something, it's in one of these things here, but I, my eyes are bad. And I went to a uh, regimental reunion. And of course it was Saturday morning and I got there on Friday and of course I had imbibed a little bit and I'm sitting there half asleep and I hear this guy is standing about five feet away and he's telling a couple of guys how he got his purple heart. He said that he and two friends of his ran under fire and jumped in a ditch and the two friends got hit. He said then I got hit and he had all kinds of cock and bull stories about what he did. None of he he didn't know what the hell happened to him. I'd take a look at this guy and he had his head shaved and he didn't have a cap on and he had a great big wound opening in his skin up a, his skin on this type of his uh, head. I took another look at him and I thought, that's the guy. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you didn't happen to get hit on the 5th of July, did you? He said, yes I did. He said, they. They got me marked for the 6th, but I think that's because I got picked up after midnight. I said, this ditch that you jumped in, that had a woods on one side of the ditch and a wheat field on the other? He said, that's right. I said, some water in the bottom of the ditch? He said, yeah, after they picked me up and took me to the hospital, he said, I thought that I wet myself, but the nurses said, no, that's swamp water of some kind. I said, do you know who came out in that hell hole that night and got your ass? I said, I did. <laughs> His wife was standing there, I swear to God, I thought that they were both going to keel over. His what was, was his reaction? I said, he just about, I thought he was going to keel over. 
He was just absolutely stunned. That's, that's written all down. Yeah, his picture is in there. Mm -hmm. And so um, the odds were must have been absolutely fantastic. But anyway, I, there he is standing there with me. That's, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You want to hold that up so the camera can get it? Yeah. Right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And his name? That's Jim O'Neill. Jim O'Neill. Jim O'Neill. Okay. Then that following spring, then he invited me out to California to his house, which was probably 20 miles from uh, Sacramento. I have a friend in Sacramento. We out to his house, you know, the potato salad and the ham and the jello and whatever. And about uh, this, this was a real horny Catholic, take my word for it. <laughs> He had, I don't know how many offspring there. I mean, there's a picture here and there's about a hundred of them. And um, one of his kids did a thing that day that's worth repeating. She was his uh, daughter by his first wife. And she got me over to the side of the uh, garden behind the house. And she said, Mr. Hardrath, you know it wasn't for you. I wouldn't be here. I said, yeah, that's right, come to think of it. Your father would have been dead as a mackerel. And instead, he came back and married your mother. That was a strange meeting. All of his children and grandchildren clustered around, looking at me like, hey, this is the guy <laughs> that's responsible for grandfather even being around, you know. It was a strange deal. So what, what happened after the incident, uh, after you got him back to the... Yeah, we got him back and of course we went right on with combat. As I said, my men were starving. Thin, worn down. But they were amazingly efficient. You'd be amazed. They had been worn into toughness by the two years of training very diligent training. And they simply kept on in combat. We overran some villages. We did... Um, these Germans were heavy, heavy now with artillery. They really were on our tails with artillery. Um, We overran a village. Um, the, the little town I got hit in. Um, Is it in here? Yeah, it's. Anyway, we overran a little village, and um, adjacent to the village was a, a potato field, and it was just really soft digging, so we dug in in the potato field for the night. Is this Angerville? Angerville? Is that it? No. no. That's later? Oh, sorry. That thing is shut off now, right? No. Okay. You want me to shut her off? Yeah. We overran a small village by the name of Angoville, and um, adjacent to one side of the town uh, was a, a potato field, soft digging, so we dug in in that field. We ran into a tank in the town, but another one of the platoons of uh, the ones that really got shot up in that town. And. Uh, my company took a beating in that little town, but I didn't. My platoon did not because we didn't happen to run into where the tank was. The following uh, day, I went to a house at the end of the um, of the potato field to make a fresh platoon roster. I uh, started off with 40 men 
And because of casualties, I got five replacements from regiment. And uh, I made up a new platoon roster, and out of the 45 men, I had 19 left. Um, I got the platoon roster all done. I went back to my uh, slit trance. And um, I wanted to get some sleep, so I went back to the small house. In the meantime, the guys from my company and from D Company had discovered a big cask of uh, apple cider in a uh, shed at the end of the house. And they were, they were really tapping into this apple cider. I did not. And so I, the Germans had used this house for an aid station. There were bloody rags laying all over the place. They had gone upstairs and brought the mattresses down, put them on the floor. I commandeered one of these mattresses and laid down there in an effort to get some sleep. <clears throat> and um, these Germans, I, I knew better. But I was so damn tired and worn out that I just didn't give a damn anymore. I never should have gone to that house. If you go in a house and they see, and I knew that they had direct observation because they were shooting at us. And, shooting artillery at us in this potato field. I'm going to back up to this potato field one time. In the evening before I went, uh, before the day of morning when I went over and did a new platoon roster, I crossed to talk to the first sergeant and turn in the casualties for the day. And of course, first sergeants don't dig decent, fox, uh, dig decent slit trenches. They're you know, worth a damn at that. And I knew that we were under direct uh, observation and uh, two rounds came in right into the potato field and I thought now while they're reloading I'll run over to my really good slit trench on the other side. I got halfway across, I know now because I went back the next morning and took a look at it. And one of those rounds crossed my chest and hit about five or six feet off to my left. And it blew me up in the air, blew my helmet way up in the air and I landed on all fours, scratching like hell, of course, to get back to that beautiful slit trench I had dug. But that ground was so soft that it absorbed the round and it went off in the dirt. And although it went off five or six feet from me, I never got hit. Now I'm in the house where I've been the, uh, where all the men are drinking the apple cider and I'm trying to get some sleep on the floor, and the Germans put a round in the shingles. And I turned up on one side. I heard it coming in, and by this time I heard so many rounds, I knew with the, with the sound, the whistle, this is gonna be really close. I turned over on my right side and took a round right in here, busted my leg wide open, and uh, busted my fever, femur broke the femur just above the knee where the bone gets wide above the femur. And, um, and of course the guys came by with, from the aid station with a stretcher and took me out of that house and took me back to the aid station, battalion aid station. A great thing happened to me there. I was of course friends with the guys at the, in the medics. And a staff sergeant of the medics came out and said, Hardrath, I don't know what, how we're going to operate in the 1st Battalion for a while. He said, all the key non-coms are getting hit today. And uh, then he did something for me I'll never forget. He gave me a, uh, two of those uh, pills that we were supposed to take with a quart of water. And... Uh, Gave me a canteen of water and I drank that. Then he gave me a uh, Baby Ruth candy bar and a Lucky Strike cigarette. And I sat there and he also gave me a shot of morphine, of course. And that morphine is soaking into my old body and I'm drifting away. I felt like a king. My candy bar, <laughs> my Lucky Strike. And the main thing was, by God, I've made it. <laughs> I'm seriously wounded <laughs> and I'm alive. From there, of course, they, they took the stretcher uh, in an ambulance down to the coast and put me in an LST, landing ship tank, and from there over to England. And then they took me in on 
on shore in England, and um, all this took the night and most of the next day. So um, the following morning then, and this was all tent hospital, field unit. And the next morning I came to and I was in an operating room and this tent was lined with white cloth and all that kind of thing. And they were operating on my leg. They operated on the leg and put it in a cast, just to the knee. And then they put me on a train and I went up to a um, regular hospital. And this was a big GI unit with a lot of patients in there. And uh, while I was there, my brother, who was an artillery man, came in and saw, came in to see me. Just by one of these freaks of nature, I saw a guy that was in his outfit, talked with him. He went back to his outfit and told my brother that your brother is wounded and laying in a hospital. And he found a ride down there and came walking in on me the next day. Weird. From that hospital, I found out that I was ZI, Zone of the Interior. That meant back to the States. So they loaded me onto another British train and I'm over to a port in England. And there they loaded me into a hospital ship, the HS Wisteria, hospital ship Wisteria. And uh, a very leisurely trip back to Charleston, South Carolina. That was something else. The guy in the, across the aisle in the hospital, they, they were close together in there, obviously. Had been, he was a big paratrooper, and he had been so thoroughly prepared, he even studied German in order to be totally prepared to talk to these birds. They had already put, um, they had put maggots on him because he had a condition that they had to clean up the wound. And he collected about a dozen of those damn things and put them in glass. <laughs> he, he showed that to me. I don't want to see this. But about after four or five nights he died. The guys in there were nice. They lifted me. I was a, now I'm in a full body cast, nothing sticking out but the necessary areas, front and back, and my left leg. I was just like a piece of two by four. If you tilted me, I stood up. You know, I couldn't stand up by myself. So I came all the way from a hospital in central England to Vaughan General Hospital in Hines, Illinois west of Chicago without a stitch clothes on. Out on a stretcher covered with a blanket and that's it. I was in that full, full, full body cast. Um, then a year in the hospital. I was ambulatory, a good share of that time. Uh, a good share of it, yeah. And uh, they gave me a lot of uh, convalescent leaves from the hospital. If I were ambulatory and the condition was uh, static at the time, they'd say, well, you might as well go home for 15 days. So I'd go back to the farm in Wisconsin. But they never could get the thing to work properly because I had osteomyelitis in the femur. In the days before penicillin or not a good drugs, they'd remove the leg right then and there. But I was lucky. And um, I finally got to the point where they thought the thing wasn't going to break up and uh, pus run out of the back of my leg anymore from this infected femur. So they assigned me back to duty, active duty, at the parachute school, Fort Benning, Georgia. I was an advanced infantry instructor. I had two years of training and a month of extremely tough combat. I didn't do anything. I was around the parachute of the school. Um, oh, I instructed, you know. Mostly I took uh, sticks of uh, paratroopers down to the Lawson Field and 
drove parachute and climb on the airplane with my stick of jumpers. And they had a guy on there that commanded the jumpers, you know, stand up and hook up and all that kind of a thing. So they did a bunch of really extensive surgery on me down at the um, post hospital, Fort Benning. And there they did the right thing. They cut away all the excess and bad material and uh, bound it up and it's never broke open again. And I go to a doctor like 25, 30 years ago and say, I had osteomyelitis in my left femur. And they say, and you got over it? I say, yes, I did. I got over it. They say, well, you're one lucky bird. That just is, with, with the medicines we have today, we can't do a good job on that. Um, I took a discharge out of Fort Benning, Georgia, and told the doctors, I said, now you know that you just operated here a couple of weeks ago on my leg and cut it all to pieces. And I said, you're not going to turn me out of here thinking that I can work at first. He said, we'll take care of you. So they turned me loose, legitimately, with a 70% disability. So I do address 70% disability compensation. That was small in those days. But you know, it was a different dollar in those days. In the meantime, while I'm in taking a sabbatical, courtesy of the United States government, after I finished my year in the hospital, in World War II you were entitled to a 10-day thing. I chose Miami Beach, Florida. So I went down to Miami Beach, Florida, and there I ran into a lovely young lady, Amber. And uh, she was from Atlanta, and I was in, I was in Fort Benning in my parachute school, so naturally I'm doing tracks back and forth between Fort Benning and Atlanta, Georgia. Amber had been married previously, and uh, Tommy Page was the neighborhood boy, all that kind of a thing. She married the guy. He was a submariner. He was on the uh, SS Keat, K-E-T-E. -E. And they went off into the, uh, I believe, I have the name of it in here somewhere, but anyway, they went off, off the uh, coast of China with their submarine and they have no idea what happened to it. He simply never came back. And so I, this young woman was uh, 23 years old, and she was a widow. And uh, I must say, she was an adventuresome soul. You take, you get married twice, and <laughs> one guy gets creamed by the Japs, and the other guy gets creamed by the Germans, you know. <laughs> That, that's stretching it a little bit, but that's exactly what happened. And I must, I'm sorry to say that she passed away a good many years ago, in November 1983. And uh, in the meantime, why, Amber and I had adopted these two little girls, and Lori is one of them, and Kim is the other one. So what did you do? I mean, did... Oh, I it... came out, and of course I did everything that Tom Brokaw put in the greatest generation. I didn't intend to be the greatest, but that's what I did. I never went to high school, but I went to college. First I went to a um, business school for a year. Amber was the, um, in Atlanta, was the um, office boss for Lovable Brazier Company uh, on Spring Street. and. Um, I was getting some disability. They cut me to 30%, which I'm at to this day. But um, Amber had her husband got killed. She got that. She took that on, I don't know, 15-year basis. Whatever. I've forgotten that. But anyway, and then I went to school. I went to college at night. And I got 105 a month for that. 30% disability. Um, Amber worked for Lovable Brazier Company, and she got the uh, insurance from her dead husband. We had four incomes. We bought a house for $5,000, nice little house, believe it or not, and our monthly note was $30.89 a month. So <laughs> we, we, we had it not, you know, 
Mm -hmm. I tell that to people nowadays, and they say, why, hell, from those four incomes, that 3089 was no problem. I said, no, it wasn't. But we were depression kids. We hung on to our money. Following that, and following, uh, I was working for a, um, oh, I had one more income. I worked for a, uh, an accounting firm, MD Ellis and Associates. Mm -hmm. two, uh, two CPAs and me. I pounded the typewriter for them, and I had a couple of clients of my own. Walter Boomershine had Boomershine and Pontiac in town at the time, and uh, M.D. Ellis was his accountant, and Walter Boomershine needed somebody to run the uh, office. So he hired me away from M.D. Ellis. Thank you, Lord. So I moved over to Boomershine Motors. And then in February of 1952, I formed uh, with Paul Edwards, we formed a 50-50 corporation called P&H Homes Incorporated, and we started P&H Realty Company, a simple partnership. And after a couple of years, we became very successful. I know what these words sound like, but that's the way it was. And we became developers and builders. Um, at one time we had 210 acres that we turned into lots, 350 lots. Sold a school site to DeKalb County, all the things that go with being a land dealer in uh, Georgia. I don't know how many houses we built. We had our own style, very distinctive if I must say so. In fact, it made one of the major picture magazines here as little as about five, six months ago after all these years. We probably built six to seven hundred houses, plus we built a, an apartment complex, very nice. 281 apartments, three pools, a bar, the works, big clubhouse, A-frame clubhouse, the whole bit. We call it checkmate. It's been about three different names since then. I have to bring up one thing. When you sat at the bar in our bar, which was in the basement of the clubhouse, you looked through a plate glass window, seven eighths of an inch thick, because it was the site of the pool that was outside of the clubhouse. And all of the women and men swimming in there were swimming on the other side of that. We thought that was absolutely great. These young men that are just we didn't take children, oh, a few of them, because of some circumstances. But we thought these young men would come in there, you know, when they'd start daydreaming and we would rent apartments like mad. That turned out to not be true. There's no girl, no matter what her moral fiber, that wants anybody to look at her while she's swimming around in a pool from the side. <laughs> Anyway, and then these jackasses held a, held a big party up there when Paul and I opened the uh, clubhouse. We had a hell of a bunch of renters already in the 281 apartments. They weren't finished, but we were renting them out. And I invited two couples to go up there with Amber and myself. And of course these people, Paul and I furnished everything, band, dance floor, food, booze, the works, dedicating the clubhouse. My wife wasn't as flexible as some ladies have been known to be. And of course they had a swimsuit contest in front of the 7 8 inch plate glass. And of course one of the girls got down there and hooked her thumb on her bottom and hauled that down to an inappropriate spot. And of course Amber is watching this. Don't take your wife to a place where ladies are pulling down their undershorts. But it worked out just fine. I'm partly kidding on that one. What we did, we built probably six, seven hundred houses. And um, I know we built 281 apartments. On December 7th, 1977, after 
25 years at this, having formed up in 52. We sold up to a consortium out of Chicago, all dentists and doctors. And uh, we sold uh, checkmate apartments. Um, we did very well. December 7th of 1977, I was done. It was the closing day, and they took over the apartment complex, and I moved out of my office, and I was retired. Okay. We're, we're kind of coming to the end of the time here, but I, I want you to... Tell me something. I said we're coming to the end of the time here, but what, oh, I'm done. what I would like to do is, you know, you that's quite a story, but in in closing, can you just, you know, it's any comments or, or yeah, I do. about and your I experience know. or whatever? I am totally um, in awe of America. I'm the kind of a guy that takes a hard look at everything we do in America. Um, if I find out we're going to go into another armed conflict, I study it from every angle that I have available to me, newspaper, radio, TV, whatever, and I have to either approve in my mind or not approve, and if I disapprove, I don't do anything about it, but I sure as hell don't vote for the guys that got us into this fracas. The men that did the job in World War II are the men that I'm still t thinking and talking about. They came out of the toughest times. My brother got drafted in January of 1941. In 1940 they passed a law for universal military training and they set up the number system and he got the low number and he got in, he went into the uh, training in Fort Sill, Oklahoma in an artillery school And at the time, he was 25 years old. He was just about done with his time because he didn't take his month of furlough. So by the time that December 7th, 1941 came along, he was pretty much done with his year. The most money my brother ever made as a civilian, and this was working in a cheese factory. He was an expert cheese maker. He worked for Harry Mandel in a cheese factory. Seven days a week. The cows give milk seven days a week. You make cheese seven days a week. So he worked seven days a week for $45 a month. That's the most money as a civilian that he ever made. He went in in the beginning of 41 and he got out in December of 46. He spent five years in the military and I have never heard him say one word, one bad word about what happened to him. And no one has ever heard me say a bad word about gimping around with a leg that's two or three inches shorter than the other one. And I think Lori can verify, she's never heard me curse my time. These two brothers from my family spent nine years of their lives, of the best years of their lives, as the old movie was, and we gave that, and I, no one has ever heard either one. And what happened to my family? Father, mother, three sons, one girl. The girl's husband went up and worked off the Yukon River and got damaged badly up there. He was a civilian. My sister with a bad heart ran their store. It hurt her. My kid brother stuck his leg accidentally into a silo filler and it cut off his right leg. So here's this couple with three boys and a girl, two of them in combat and one with his right leg off. World War II was an expensive deal. And when it was all over with, my father and mother never cursed the war or ever said anything bad about it. They knew that their boys had taken a real beating out of the deal nor will they ever hear out of me. Um, this was a strong gang, and they came out of nothing, and they did a hell of a job. 
my guy could walk out there and they knew somebody's going to get creamed that day. But that platoon, you just say, oh, we're moving on. And they are on their feet. They're dead tired. Um, it was an amazing thing. Um, my last observation is going to be that people ask me if you were in the same situation, would you enlist again? And I say, yeah, if I studied the situation like listening to Hitler scream over the radio and my father interpreting, and I made up my mind what that was and what the Japs were, yes, I'd go in again. I'd take my shot. That's what I did. We got in a war. I stuck my ass out there and it got hit. So there. Well, we want to thank you for your service and particularly thank you for sharing your story with yeah. us. It's a very good story. Um, and it's something to be proud of. So, thank you. Yeah, I feel good. I feel good about being here with y'all. I do. I've, I think you're doing a tremendous job. Thank you.